Very real blessings, yeah. I didn't know he was going to lead that song. I came up to him, I said, oh, by the way, could you lead Count Your Blessings, you know, because I'm preaching, and he had already selected that song. So we, we sing that song, and the refrain encourages us to count our blessings one by one to see what God has done. The idea, of course, is to focus on individual things, very real things in our lives that contribute to our happiness and give God the glory, you know, give Him the credit for these things. Sometimes, especially when we, you know, we're down or sad or stressed, it helps us to specify what our blessings are from God so that we can better appreciate them and appreciate the God who provides. I've always found that to be a marvelous spiritual exercise, especially during difficult moments, illness, boredom. Sometimes I'd rather be ill than bored. But during times that are difficult, the natural thing to do is to review the difficulty and you know, whine, moan, you know. but reviewing the blessings I find, uh, what a marvelous way to, to pick oneself up and to get things into perspective. Each year, of course, Americans celebrate uh, Thanksgiving Day. It's a good thing, it's a good holiday, one of my favorite holidays. It's a general holiday where people are encouraged to appreciate this nation and all the things that we have here. If any, if any nation can celebrate Thanksgiving, it's here. So my lesson tonight, I'd like to get a little more specific about the very real blessings that we have and that we should be thankful for each and, and every day. Now the first group of blessings are the most obvious ones I want to talk about, the ones that we can see and touch, the ones we can measure, count. Actually the, the number of these are beyond measure, but there are a few that uh, we tend to take for granted and, and we should mention them. For example, we have food. Boy, do we have food. You know, despite the doom and gloom of uh, quote, climate change, our markets, you ever notice, are bursting with every kind of fruit and grain and vegetable and meat possible. We've got too much food, actually. In a world where millions of people go to bed hungry, our main worry here in the United States is that we have too much food, not too little food. We have to discipline ourselves not to eat too much. Quite a contrast to other places and other people who could only dream about having too much food. We, um, we have jobs. In a free market system like ours, the uh, unemployment rate is usually between four or five percent. It's not possible to get it much lower than four percent because of the cycle of workers leaving one job and going to another. You, know, you never get it down to zero percent. In the United States, our current rate of unemployment, 3.9 percent, this means that 96% of the people who want to work or who want a job have a job. Economically and statistically, it doesn't get much better than this. Okay, you may not have the job that you want or the job that you think you deserve, maybe you could use more money, but we all have paying jobs and, and that's a very real blessing. We have peace. The history of the world is the history of war, interrupted by short periods of peace. The United States as a nation has been at peace for decades. Oh yes, of course, terrorist attacks, foreign wars, threats of war, but here in America, no civil war, there are no armies occupying, uh, occupying our cities, nobody's shelling our buildings. We complain a lot and we comment on other nations' problems, but we ourselves here don't suffer from that. If you don't think that years of political freedom and civil peace are a blessing, ask people from other countries who have experienced war and oppression if this is not a true blessing. Ask the relatives of what, 500,000 people in Syria who have been killed by their own president dropping barrel bombs in housing developments, indiscriminately killing women, children, babies, elderly. 
a million refugees wandering, just trying to get out of the way of the bullet. That's their reality. Like I said, we take these type of blessings for granted, uh, but we shouldn't because a change in weather could damage our harvest, resulting in food shortages. The best farming techniques can't control drought or floods. God does this. And there's no guarantee that the economy will always be good. Economies are fragile things. And the government can't protect you if there's a depression that throws many people out of work. We know this, we remember Great Depression, the great one, you know, in 1929, but there have been others. And of course, we shouldn't uh, take peace for granted either. Wars can begin over little things. Leaders with big egos have been known to plunge their nations into foolish and bloody wars. One person with one bomb could destroy our sense of peace and, and safety, and we, we know about that. Now I say this because these blessings that we have are very real and we are actually experiencing them now and we should be thankful for them because they can disappear. I mean, I still remember the day I was in California in those days. I mean, I re, as, as you do, when the, the towers, you know, when the planes flew into the towers, we, most of us would remember where we were and what happened and we were saying, is this real? Is this actually happening? I still remember with the sound of the people going, oh no, oh no, as they saw the towers begin to crash down. At first it was an accident. Wow, isn't that amazing? A plane hitting a building? And when people realized it was on purpose, when they realized there was a second plane, when they realized that this tremendous construction was starting to just fall down and fall apart, I, I remember a sense of unreality. What happened? And that happened just like that in one day, bang, a new reality. Of course, as Christians, we not only give thanks for physical things, we also give thanks for spiritual things that we enjoy in Christ. Again, these are numerous, but a few very tangible ones that I'd like to mention. We have the knowledge of the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. Think about that for a second. We know the truth about where and how the world began. We know the truth about that. We know the truth about why we exist. We know the truth about how it will end, this world, and what will happen. We know the truth about what happens after death and how we prepare for death. We know the truth about that. We don't speculate. We're not guessing. We know the truth about how to live in this world. We know who and how God is. We know that. We're free from ignorance and fear and shame and condemnation. We have the truth against which all things can be measured. That's a blessing. Another thing we have, friendship with God. Jesus said, you are my friends, John 15, 14. You know, most of us strive to find and keep friends. They are among the most precious things that we have. Many try to cultivate friendships among the rich and the powerful to gain advantage somehow. But we, as Christians, we are friends with God, the creator of wealth, the seat of all power. In the Old Testament, the Jews had to go through a, a priest and, 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 and he in turn had to go through an elaborate ceremony in order to communicate with God. And violation of the manner of communication resulted in death. But as Christians, we are intimate friends with God. We talk to Him when we want to. Do you ever think about that? Whenever we want to talk to God, we can. It doesn't matter if we're sitting down or lying down or in our kitchen or in our backyard, we can talk to God at any time. We can ask for forgiveness at any time. 
We can ask for favors, we can praise, we can rejoice each and every single day. Why? Because we're friends with God and we know who He is. And we know what He wants and we know what pleases Him. We know all these things. And I think one of the most comforting things is that God enjoys our company. And because of Christ, we enjoy His company. And we enjoy it without fear without condemnation, without ceremony, without dread, because we look forward to being together with Him in heaven someday. An arrangement that He Himself has organized and guaranteed us through His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for that. We have eternal life. That's such a big thing. You know, it's such a big thing, you can't even get your mind around all of it. For God so loved the world that uh, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. We will not be extinguished. Isn't that, isn't that the, the, the most painful thing when we lose someone? They're not there anymore. They were there, they were just, you know, how many times have you said when you've gone to a funeral or you hear about the death of someone, usually, and someone younger, and you say to you, well, not even. You say to yourself, I was just talking to her. I just, we just talked last week or yesterday, I dropped by, it seemed fine to me. And then they're, they're gone. They're not here anymore, they're extinguished. That was the hardest thing that I had to kind of grasp you know, when I was a young guy, a young kid actually, and when my dad died, the thought, I'll never see him again, I'll never see him again. But God promises us eternal life. I will not be extinguished. I will be me, but a perfect version of that forever. This is the great promise of Christianity. The ceremonies that we do all point to this. We only have two ceremonies in Christianity. Baptism acts out a burial and a resurrection to a new life. That's the ceremony that does that. And communion reminds us of the way that this was accomplished through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Both of these things intertwine. Regardless of the condition of our lives now, the great blessing of Christianity is that we know that we will always be us. And someday we'll become the us that we always wanted to be forever. I mentioned in our class this morning that uh, 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 perfection, uh, Christians know that they're not perfect, but they want to be. I know I'm not perfect, but I so want to be perfect. I know that I sin, but I so not want to sin. I see out there and I sense in me, there's a better me that I'm always striving for. The promise that God has made to me is that one day that will take place, finally. Paul says that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And these three, the knowledge of the truth, friendship with God, and eternal life are the very real blessings into which all of the other blessings fit. Now, this review of our blessings would not be complete if we didn't mention some of the very real blessings that we, as Christians, here in this particular congregation enjoy. For example, we have unity. Amen. Yeah, thank you. We have unity. There is one mind and there's one heart in this congregation. It exists and it's evident. Oh, there are the normal stresses and strains that occur from time to time, but that's normal in any family. But we are united in belief and in hope and in love for God and, and for one another.
While in the society around us there is suspicion and intolerance and division among cultural or political groups, there's none of that here. The Choctaw congregation will be celebrating, speaking of celebrating things, the Choctaw congregation will be celebrating the 80th year since its founding in September of 1939. And there has never been a split or a division where an entire group you know, leaves because you know, they didn't get along with a certain elder or I didn't like the preacher or whatever and decided to start their own church. That's never happened here. We're enjoying a, a golden period of peace and unity. Not every church has this. We have to realize that this is a very great and very real blessing. It's a marvelous thing. Yeah, that celebration this morning, you know, eight, was it eight people, eight of, of, of the individuals who are 90 plus years. And most of the people that were at church went to this thing. And then two hours later, there was another celebration for another couple here celebrating their 40th anniversary. And I kind of dropped in there this afternoon and the house was packed with who? Well, with people from here. And when I came back here for the five o'clock service, who did I find? Well, the people that went to that thing and then they went over to the thing that I don't know when they ate, <laughs> came back tonight. We have unity. That's a marvelous thing. We have opportunity here at Choctaw. In many places, the church has to deal with war or civil unrest or tragedy, poverty, disease, persecution. Most of the church's efforts are invested in just staying alive. When I was in Montreal working for that church there, I mean, most of our efforts were just to, to stay alive. We're, we're a small group in a huge city. We, on the other hand, we have peace, we have prosperity, we have uh, modern technology uh, that we can use. Our church is growing as new members are added in a variety of ways. A dozen baptisms, nearly 30 people just placed membership. Our average attendance continues to grow, over 300 uh, each week. We have three full-time ministers and a, a full-time ministry intern in training. While in many other churches, one minister is caring for maybe that church and maybe two congregations. I mean, opportunity is just staring us in the face. Opportunity to reach out and share our faith in person or online or through courses or whatever. Opportunity to build the, the busiest and strongest and most fruitful New Testament church in the Eastern County were already the largest. Opportunity to prepare uh, new elders and deacons and ministers for, uh, for our future leadership. Opportunity to grow and plant churches in other parts of the state where there are none. Opportunity to grow old together watching our children and our children's children know God, build relationships with one another in Christ, and start their own Christian homes. Isn't that a marvelous thing? I, I love to see it. You know, there's, every couple of years there's a new group of little kids who are going through uh, the initiation stage of being members of this congregation. And that involves some very special ceremonies. It means uh, when you finally can walk, it means that now you can walk down the aisle and climb up on the stage, right? Every kid in this church has done that, right? all the moms and grandmas, right? And then you are able to go to the water fountain and get a drink of water for yourself, by yourself, nobody holding anything for you. you can, it looks more like they're washing their face they're actually, that, that, that is like independence. How many little kids have we seen in the last several years? <laughs> they're all the same. They all want to get on the stage and get a drink and run outside. It's a beautiful thing. Not every congregation has these opportunities. Not every church can devote all its efforts to growth. We need to recognize what we have here. 
and not let these opportunities just fly by without taking advantage of these things. You know, when you stop to think about it, all of these physical and spiritual and individual blessings can overwhelm us. We're not always knowing what to do with all of these things. In order to really appreciate all we have fully, here are just a few things that we need to do. This is the so what part of the sermon. Okay, we got all this stuff, now what? Well, here's a couple of suggestions. First of all, let's give thanks for all of our blessings. You can't really be satisfied with your blessings unless you give thanks. This is why many you know, very wealthy people or those with great talent or advantages but no faith often feel unfulfilled and unsatisfied. They're not grateful. They don't give thanks to God. Paul says that this is the sin that leads to all other sins in Romans 1.21. He says, for even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were darkened. The first sin, neglect to say thank you. And that one leads to all the others. Giving thanks and having a grateful heart before God is what enables us to actually enjoy our blessings with a clear conscience and a peaceful heart. The nation feels thankful you know, once a year uh, on the holiday. As Christians, we should give thanks and be grateful for everything, every single day, and in doing so, enjoy the spiritual blessings that come from having a thankful heart. Another thing to do in order to fully appreciate the many blessings that we have, take the time to enjoy them. Why is it that as Christians, many times we feel guilty when things are going great? People are in such a hurry. They miss so many wonderful things in life. It's not a sin to take the time to savor or to enjoy or to taste the good things of God. It's okay to celebrate with food and laughter and fellowship. Did Jesus not attend a wedding as well as a funeral? Do we think we're better Christians because you know, we don't laugh as hard as we could? that we don't rejoice, that we don't celebrate often, does that mean we're holier somehow? Paul says that self-denial for its own sake may look like true religion, but it has no power to make you better or more pleasing to God. Colossians 2, 16 to 23. Why do you think God gave the Jews many festivals throughout the year where they were to celebrate and feast and rejoice and be thankful, not just for a day, for a week? Brothers and sisters, life is hard enough all by itself. God wants us to be thankful and actually enjoy the things that He has given us to enjoy. If as a dad and a grandfather, you can enjoy watching your son or watching your daughter play with something that you've given them, imagine the satisfaction that God takes as our Father, observing how we enjoy and savor the good things that He's given us, same thing. And then finally, in the face of so many blessings, we need to take advantage of our blessings. For example, our physical blessings. As far as our physical blessings, build on them. Grow, invest in yourself, invest in your family, your church, your business, your community. Solomon says that you need to cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days, Ecclesiastes 11.1. 1. In other words, launch out. Step out in faith, step up, take responsibility. God will provide, don't be afraid. Speaking of the 90 year olds, you know, they did a survey among uh, 80, plus, 80 year old plus people and among other things they asked them what was the thing that they regret the most that they didn't do in their life. They weren't talking about did you ever commit a crime, uh, do, you, do you regret, that's not the point. As far as positive things in life, what, what, what didn't you do enough of? And the majority answered, I didn't 
take enough risks. I played it too safe. I didn't step out when the, when the opportunity was there. And especially for people of faith. And finally, uh, taking advantage of, um, of our times of blessings uh, is necessary because they don't, always, they don't always go on indefinitely. You don't always have your health. You don't always have opportunity. God gives us blessings and I sincerely believe that He enjoys the fact that we exploit them, that we enjoy them, that we use them, that we share them, that we rejoice in them. We should also take advantage of our, our, our spiritual blessings. As far as our spiritual blessings are concerned, let's remember to actually take advantage of the things that God has given us in Christ Jesus. Yeah, He gives us physical things, but He gives us spiritual things too to take advantage of. And the way to do that is to take a step forward in our own growth process. Take a step. Take the next step that you need to take in order to grow in Christ. And you know what that is. You know, what is it? Give up a bad habit today? Is, that, is today the day? You know, I think this thing, I'm going to let this go. Today's the day. Marty mentioned it this morning, excellent lesson. Uh, we were talking about taking his lesson and making a link and putting it on Bible Talk because that's one of the most asked questions that we get on Bible Talk is about baptism. And I retype it over and over again. So now I'm just going to say, OK, link to this lesson. Speaking of baptism, is there anyone here after all of the teaching that we've received on that subject that has not yet been baptized? If that's the step, please take it or be restored without delay or be reconciled Two, you fill in the blank. Your wife, your daughter, your son, your friend, your ex, whatever. Be reconciled. Or maybe start a new ministry. Whatever the next step is, you know what it is. And you know what? God knows what it is too. Take advantage of the blessings and take the next step. If you want to show your gratitude for all of your many blessings by taking a step forward. The best way to do it is to do it when you know it. If you know the thing you need to do, then do it as soon as you can. This does show respect for God and gratitude for the insight He may have given you in that particular thing. If you need the prayers of the church, of course, always finish our lessons with the opportunity to minister. And as I've mentioned before, our elders are here and our deacons and our ministers are here to pray with you, to listen to what your needs may be. The church is here to minister to you. And so if that's what you need, if that's the step you need to take to reach out and seek some help, some support, some encouragement, that's okay too. The church is here to do that very thing. Uh, Brother Harold has a song of uh, encouragement and I guess we'll stand now, we'll sing that song and if you have a particular need please come forward now as we sing that song.